This is Status Quo. My name is Spencer Snyder, and today I want to talk about Liz Cheney and how she is currently a protagonist in a show that has gone on for way too many seasons called America. Liz Cheney, if you don't know, is the vice chair of the House Committee on the January 6th attack, and Jan 6 hearings have been getting a lot of coverage. How much coverage? I will show you. Let's pick a day at random. How about Tuesday? Heads, CNN, tails, MSNBC. CNN it is. Anderson Cooper, Don Lemon, about five hours in total. And when you consider that in the 24 hour period, six hours are devoted to commercials, five hours is almost a third of all their programming. That is a lot of time to be covering one topic. But Liz Cheney, being the vice chair, has become one of the stars of the investigation to the point that she has developed a new, unlikely base of donors, Democrats. She's up for re-election, obviously, and right now she's being primaried from an opponent who is backed by Trump and is polling ahead of Cheney. So she may end up losing her seat anyway, but the point is she has earned the favorability of Democrats. And for someone who voted in line with Trump something like 90% of the time, that's kind of weird. But if you're watching the news, it's easy to imagine why. Because I'm going to play a few clips and I want to see if you can identify the difference in how they discuss Liz Cheney. Republican Congress member Liz Cheney, the vice chair of the January 6 committee, accused Donald Trump of refusing to defend the Constitution. Donald Trump's own White House counsel, his own White House staff, members of his own family, all implored him to immediately intervene to condemn the violence. That was Democracy Now! Now for the others. We owe a debt to all of those who have and will appear here. To all who have and will appear here. We'll see who else answers the committee's call. Liz Cheney known for dropping the bombs and dropping the hints. Republican Congresswoman Liz Cheney defended her work on the January 6th committee during a primary debate last night. She knew what she was getting into when she stood up for truth instead of Donald Trump. She's willing to lose her job over this. Point blank, putting her career on the line. Bowling that shows uh, Liz Cheney underwater, but you know, there's still a lot of time left in this race. A lot of time left, and if you read that speech, it was a long speech, but if you read it and condense it. I think you do see a national candidate there. You can find a 12-minute stump speech in there that would be a candidate for president. In the Democracy Now! clip, there was no editorializing on the bravery or character of Liz Cheney. There's no need to manufacture sympathy for her, even in the face of a primary against someone who, I suppose, is even more dangerous. She's not a character in a show. We don't need to feel any way toward anyone in Washington who's just doing their job and whose salary we pay anyway. I also want to point out that I would imagine it's safe at this point to say that the liberal media has spent more time on Liz Cheney's primary than many Democratic primaries with progressive challengers. And ingesting that media all day has more than likely driven some donations her way. But what I want to drill down on is the fact that these pundits essentially act as a panel of post-show commentators for fans who haven't gotten enough content. That is where they assign favor or disfavor, protagonist or antagonist status. This is something cable news does in lieu of meaningful discussion. These news shows are also similar to a post-show commentary segment in that they exist to occupy your attention. Because your attention and your viewership equals ad dollars. These shows are not allowed to operate in the red. They don't exist to provide a public service. Occasionally they do, but usually they don't. They exist to make a profit, and the way to do that is to entertain. And one way they entertain and hold attention is by building up characters and conveying urgency. But Liz Cheney is not your friend. In 2019, Liz Cheney attacked Elizabeth Warren for her pretty reasonable policy of committing to no preemptive nuclear strikes. Key question for Elizabeth Warren today, which American cities and how many American citizens are you willing to sacrifice with your policy of forcing the U.S. to absorb a nuclear attack before we can strike back? No surprise, commie Bernie Sanders, who honeymooned in Soviet Union, is okay with U.S. getting attacked first. On a side note, he seems to have daddy issues with my daddy. 
That's probably because your daddy helped get as many as a million people killed in Iraq. Speaking of which, she's also pro-torture. This is her from last year. Waterboarding, AKA torture. Well, it's not torture, but you support waterboarding. I do, absolutely. And even though she's made it her mission to battle the lie that Trump won the 2020 election, other conspiracy theories she's ostensibly been down for, because in 2009, she refused to denounce the Obama birther conspiracy. Fundamentally uncomfortable, and they're fundamentally, I think, increasingly uncomfortable <laughs> with an American president who seems to be afraid to defend America, right. who seems to be right, afraid James, to stand up for what that? we believe yeah, in. I and I think that the kind of thing uh, you saw on yeah, this video yeah. uh, is indicative yeah, of ahead. a general <laughs> feeling of discomfort. These poor, pathetic people are believing stuff just like just like Miss Cheney tonight. She refuses to say this is ludicrous because she actually wants to encourage these people who believed it. Trump famously also also a promoter of birtherism. So that's nice that she seems to be doing her job, and her willingness to buck her party is commendable, but let's remember two things. One, there is no risk for her in any of the choices she's made or is going to make. If you are an hourly employee who decides to picket or form a union, there is risk. You risk losing your job, losing your income, losing your house. If you decide to live openly as gay or trans, especially in certain parts of the country, you introduce risk and fear into your life. Liz Cheney is rich. Her family is rich. If she were unemployable, it would be fine. If she loses her seat, she can become a lobbyist. She can give paid speeches. She can do any number of things that she'll be overpaid for. And if she leans a little bit harder into her current assigned protagonist status, she can join the constellation of turncoat Republicans currently employed by MSNBC and CNN as pundits and political analysts. My favorite kind of pundit is the former politician who opines on election strategy, but of course, they're only a pundit because they lost an election. This may be Liz Cheney's future, God help us. That's one. And two, Jan 6 is but one thing, and this is not to dismiss the gravity of January 6th and the investigation, but while pundits spent, over the course of a week, dozens of hours cycling through the same details from the hearings, or going over the handful of other stories that occupied the news cycle, life continues. And for some, life continues quite harshly. Which brings me to Philadelphia. Philadelphia has a few universities, and in the 60s, a few of those universities, University of Pennsylvania, Drexel, some medical institutions, came together and formed the West Philadelphia Corporation. This corporation was going to undertake some projects, build some things. This West Philadelphia Corporation established a new neighborhood called University City. And one of their major projects in University City was going to be a new science center. The issue was, Philadelphia is kind of an old city. There's not just tons of empty blocks to designate as new neighborhoods. If you want to build something, you have to tear something down first. Because as it so happens, the new neighborhood of University City overlapped with the old neighborhood known as Black Bottom. And the new Science Center, as well as other projects, overlapped with some people's houses. And wouldn't you know it, the projects went through, and what happened to the thousands of people living in the new, old neighborhood? They were displaced. However, obviously, that wasn't the end of the story. Residents were angry. There was organizing. In 1969, Penn students participated in a sit-in, seeking a housing system for families at risk of being displaced by the expansion of University City. The sit-in resulted in a commission created to address displacement and included an agreement that required Penn to fund replacement housing for residents displaced by further expansion. This fervor laid the foundation for the establishment of an affordable housing complex. With the support of the city, IBIT Associates constructed the University City townhomes in 1983 and entered a contract with HUD to provide affordable housing. So IBIT Associates constructed these townhomes to be affordable housing, and last year, IBIT Associates decided to end their contract with HUD and sell the lot. Now think, some of the people in University City townhomes have been there for decades. People who moved in, had kids, saw their kids grow up, and move out. Well, last year, University City townhomes 
told all of their residents they had to leave. It's almost like something similar to this has happened in the past. And why is this happening? The apartment complex's location has already drawn the attention from estate companies that focus on developing lab and manufacturing space for life sciences companies, according to the Philadelphia Business Journal. Based on its size and its development, the parcel could sell for up to $100 million, the report said. It's happening because the land is worth a lot of money. Of course. But why should anyone have to leave their homes so that some people at a real estate firm, who probably have really nice homes they would hate to have to leave, can make even more money? So residents have resisted. Currently, they have an encampment set up at the property, and the landlords have begun to escalate, with tactics ranging from allegedly locking the laundry room to attempts to legally force people to disband. I'm dealing with a lot of anxiety and panic attacks because every day is nerve-wracking. I don't know what's next, what Altman's going to do. He doesn't want to speak to us, so that's very scary. I mean, how are you going to have a landlord that don't want to help his tenants? Or he, he sees that we're protesting, so he had to figure, well, something for all, let me get together and see what I could do. No, he doesn't care at all. I have never, I've been here 24 years. I've never seen him. Now you figure he would show his face, especially that we're dealing with this situation. No. These children out here, they, they feel safe. And we feel safe knowing that they can feel safe and be outside and play. Because a lot of areas, you can't do that. Because you got to worry about your kid getting shot or worry about you getting shot. And this community kind of relieves that instance for us. And see, a lot of communities, you don't have that. So why would you try to strip that safe haven away from people? Now, we don't know exactly what the outcome of all this will be, but history gives us some idea. This is exactly the kind of story that would benefit from a sustained media campaign that would engender public pressure and hopefully force a company like Ibit Associates to back down or offer more or something. Imagine if anyone who was so terminally fused to their TVs that they donated to Liz Cheney instead donated that money to a legal fund for tenants of University City townhomes. And of course, the value in such reporting goes way beyond just what's going on in West Philadelphia because gentrification and rising rents are everywhere. Real estate firms trying to squeeze the blood out of anything that's breathing is not unique. These firms spent $90 million on lobbying last year alone. And the thing with stories like this, stories about housing, healthcare, people's material conditions, the ratings that are sustenance for these huge media companies? A drop in ratings means a drop in earnings, and there's too much pressure on too many people to maintain that profit directive. So to these news networks, there's risk and limited utility in doing a report for the sake of providing high-profile scrutiny. And certainly a story like this could totally have a four or five minute profile in the middle of the day, maybe not on Fox, but to be featured for five, 10, 20 minutes on every show, not likely. And that is why supporting independent media is crucial. So like and share this video, send it to someone who watches CNN, uh, smash the subscribe button as if your dad lied about it having WMDs. You can become a sustaining member at statuscoup.com and I will see you in the next one.